Welcome to the Cedar Fort Publishing and Media Behind the Scenes podcast. We're happy that you joined with us today. Every Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, we'll bring you interesting insights as we interview the authors of Cedar Fort. I am your host, Bryce Mortimer, owner of Cedar Fort Publishing and Media, and my co-host is Valerie Loveless. Today, we go behind the scenes with Brandon Sulser, author of We Are All Paralyzed, the remarkable true story of choosing to live after four life-threatening accidents. Welcome, Brandon. Thanks for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, guys. Hi, Brandon. Welcome. Hi, Valerie. Thanks for having me. Look forward to chatting about my life. Yes. So, Brandon, you have an amazing story. So, when you were 12 years old, uh, right after you moved to Utah, you passed out on your bike and crashed. And sure. this is when you suffered a traumatic brain injury or a TBI. And the doctor sent you home with a diagnosis of a concussion that night. Um, but you thought that you would die that night. What happened next? Yeah. Um, well, after I uh, had the concussion, I, I was out for 10 minutes, thereabout. And, but let me actually briefly go back, if I may, to set up kind of sure. the scene of, of how, that all, how that all happened. Uh, I was I was the new kid in the Boy Scout troop, and as kids are, you know, we uh, we want to fit in first, right? And uh, I, I knew that a lot of the scouts or all the scouts at the time they weren't wearing helmets, and I thought, well, if I if I'm going to fit in, I'm not going to wear a helmet, uh, which was a mistake. Uh, but as I was going down it's Mueller Park Canyon, it's a very popular uh, trail. Um, I told my friends, my new friends that um, go ahead and go down the hill without me. I, I, I felt an overwhelming feeling of, uh, of, of being close to our, our Savior and our Heavenly Father. And I told them, you know what, I'm going to say a prayer, and then I'll catch up to you. What kid at the age of 12 says that to their, their friends they're trying to, you know, to fit in with? But I did. And uh, when I got up from my prayer, I felt... I felt like something big was going to happen, not knowing what that was going to be. I got back on my bike and uh, went down the hill and, and got to the bottom of the trail. And right as I was getting off the trail onto the road, that's when I blacked out. Uh, I had no idea why or how. And when I woke up, um, I had my Boy Scout troop around me and the ambulance. And the first words I remember saying is, Guys, I've got to tell you about this amazing experience that I had and the people I met. It's, it's amazing, and I need to tell you. And, and, of course, at the time, my head was bleeding. Um, I looked horrible. And the paramedic is like, you know, Brandon, you'll have plenty of time. You've got a bad concussion. The best thing for you is just to calm down and not say anything. And so I, I, I tried as hard as it was to not tell about the experience um, until I got down to the hospital. And uh, then again, I told my mom about the experience I wanted to. And then the uh, x-ray technician came in and said, you know, we got to take you in for an x-ray. An hour went by. And, uh, you know, I came back to my parents. My parents asked me, Brandon, what, what, tell us about this experience that you had. And I just started to cry because for some reason, it was completely erased, right, when I wanted to talk about it. And the only way I can describe it, it's like it's trying to open a sealed door that can't be opened. But what's behind that, I know, is was very special for me. And uh, I mentioned that in my book. And I mentioned, I think, you know, the beginning of our heartache is probably the beginning of our Heavenly Father's as well. When he sees his sons and daughters go through hard things. And that was the start of my hard things. Um, that night, oddly enough, uh, even though the doctor said I was okay, I felt like I was dying. And I had my dad give me a priesthood blessing. And I said, Dad, I feel like I've got to keep my spiritual body um, in my body. I'm fighting with it. And right when I said that, my whole body went ghost white. And they knew that I was, you know, I was serious. And so he gave me a blessing. And uh, that night I wasn't fighting it. But I was very close to the bell. I could feel it. And I could have crossed over um, if I allowed myself to. But it wasn't the right time for me. Wow. That must have been really scary. It was. It was. I mean, being 12, year, 12 years old and, and being, you know, so young and, and having, you know, the rest of your life to look forward to and having something like this happen was, 
was very traumatic, but you know, I was born with goodly parents and, and I knew that even if I did die, that I'd be okay. Um, when I was rushed that morning, I was rushed to the hospital again because my whole head was like a giant sponge. I went to go put my fingers down on my scalp and, uh, it was sink in and surely that's not normal, right? For a concussion. And so we went back in and I, I could barely walk. I was dizzy and they sent me into the x-ray. They sent me in for a CAT scan. And, uh, the next thing I remember hearing is the, uh, the technician and the doctor yelling at, yelling at each other, saying that they made a horrible mistake and that I am bound to die within seconds or minutes. And that's not something you, you kind of want to hear when you're in, in, in the, uh, um, you know, CAT scan room. And so they rushed me out. And, and for some reason, I knew I'd be okay, though. They thought any minute I could go. And so I was lifelighted to Primary Children's Hospital. And I knew, you know, I, I told my parents goodbye, but I knew the Lord wouldn't take my life in the life light if he saved it the night prior. And uh, I don't remember a lot of my operation afterwards, but it was like, you know, eight or nine hour surgery. And, and uh, I do remember this though. Um, the doctors, all of them came to me a few days afterwards and they told us about the miracle that took place. And they said, you know, Brandon, we've never seen this before ever in the Journal of Medicine, but we went in there planning to save your life, but we realized that someone already beat us to it. And we're like, what do you mean? They said, well, Brandon, the main artery broke inside of your head. You usually die hours after that. And here it's been well over, you know, 24 to 48 hours. And the doctors went in there and they noticed that my main artery had a blood clot. And from their best guess, they think that that blood clot occurred uh, the night prior, which would have been the time my dad gave me a priesthood blessing. And so I, you know, at a young age, I learned to rely upon God and the power of the priesthood. And, you know, if it's God's will and, you know, we ask in faith, miracles can happen. And it sure did in my life. But, you know, of course, as you guys read the book, uh, I, it did not go without many, many difficulties with speaking. It took me five years to learn how to speak again fluently. I forgot to do my spelling and my math. And it was kind of the... Uh, the first remodeling period that I had in my life to strengthen me to be able to withstand and, and push forward through the other challenges unknowingly to me that I was going to face. You know, you, you fast forward a little bit from this experience and uh, you're now 18. And by the way, when yeah. I was reading the book, uh, you, you always seem to have a really positive attitude. I mean, I, I remember at one point you talk about starting uh, eighth grade and and uh, one of the kids the ninth graders pulls the hat off of your head that reveals uh, the scars yes. and and the healing and and uh, everything that's going on there and at that point you had a really crucial decision to make I mean what was that like it was it was tough it was tough because you know I, I I knew I was going literally into the lion's den for a for a young 12 year old um, into you know first day in junior high and junior high is not easy for youth um, even even youth that you know are are normal without without any disability and and uh, with me I was scared because I was wearing a hel uh, not a helmet I was wearing a hat and the hat was covered in something I was trying to hide and that and, was and you were the only student who could who was exactly. allowed to have a hat <laughs> yeah and 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 no one knew right like none of the kids knew and so like hey this seventh grader is breaking the rules let's take off his hat and. It was the first hour I was at school, you know, these big ninth graders come up and they say, hey, seventh grader, hats aren't allowed. I'm like, oh, no, oh, no. And they take off my hat. And then it reveals everything I was trying to hide, which was my scar. I know in the book I mentioned I look like Frankenstein, uh, which I think is pretty similar. There's a photo in the book of, of that, you know, incision. I call it the DMZ line because it was just gnarly. And uh, it revealed it revealed uh, everything that I went through. And, um, you know, I was made fun of, I was bullied, and I had a choice to make. Do I reach down and grab anger or sadness, or do I reach up and, and grab my faith and, and, uh, and make this a, a moment in time where I can look back in the eternities and say, that was a special moment for me. That's when I chose um, 
to stand up, to stand up for, for me. And, and I responded in the right way, not out of anger, but if you read, I responded out of, out of love. Right. And I, I, uh, I switched the script instead of having it something that people were fearful of. I was open and I told them exactly what it was. And it became a, a medal of honor instead of something that I was trying to hide. And it's all based upon how I responded. Um, you know, each situation, I believe it's either a bittering or bettering situation that we have in life. And yeah, the attitude I took on was, it was an attitude of embracing my faith, uh, not walking away from it. I realized that no situation has ever become easier because one has walked away from God. And uh, I wasn't about to do that then. And, um, you know, it was hard for me because at the time I, I couldn't react like I wanted to. I, I stuttered immensely. I, I couldn't form sentences. And so, you know, as you read in the book, I, 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 I stuttered and sputtered and, and, and did as good as I could to, to uh, make this a, you know, a, a positive learning experience for me and for those around me. But make no, but make no mistake, mistake about it. It was very difficult for me. And uh, those first few years of school were very trying. And, you know, at times I, I, I got very depressed and uh, was overwhelmed by uh, struggling with learning and speaking and, and just fitting in. Well, and then if we fast forward, here we are when you're 18 or 19 years old this time in your life it seems like you've got everything kind of falling back into place you're about ready to go on a mission you have a girlfriend you're with the family down in lake powell uh having a good time with yeah. a couple families you're on a big oh, houseboat yeah. yeah and uh and then tell us what happens uh when you're at lake powell yeah you know i that time in my life i thought i had everything um i think that chapter is called king in the mountain because truly that's how I felt. Um, you know, I, I was able to get my speaking back. I was able to get to being the Brandon that I knew I was prior to being at 12 when I had my TBI. Um, I was very, very strong and I took pride in that. Um, what's interesting is, if I, if I may, um, five months before I went to Lake Powell, um, I was in the gym and I worked out religiously. Besides reading the scriptures, it was a gym. And, um, what's interesting though, is that I could not leave the gym with that, you know, that small voice we have within that small voice that speaks truth was screaming at me, you know, politely, uh, saying, Brandon, dude, you have to work out your neck. And, uh, that's something that I never even crossed my mind and, and I did, and, uh, I couldn't leave the gym without that. And so listening to that small voice end up saving my life. And, you know, when, when I did break my neck, uh, but how the accident happened, yes, it, I had just graduated from high school, and, and I was getting ready. I, I just got done putting in my mission papers, and this was going to be the last trip that I was going to go on with my family, with my girlfriend's family at the time, and with some friends. And I wanted this to be a very memorable experience for everybody. Um, in the back of my mind, though, I, I felt like something was going to happen. Uh, in the book, it talks about the prayer that I would give. I did that every day for, you know, it was four months prior to, to leaving. Um, but in the prayer, it asks, you know, it talks about how I want to serve and be a missionary and how, you know, I was looking forward to that. That, that was a big part of my life. And so what happened was I was um, running down the sand hill down at Moki Canyon. Uh, many of you guys are probably are familiar with that canyon. They have large sand hills. And, and uh, I got there and my sister was on my lap and I pointed to this big sand hill up there and I said, you know, I'm going to run down that hill. And, you know, everyone thought, oh, it's going to be, you know, cool and it's safe. You know, I'm not doing anything dumb or, or you know, scary or anything to cause, you know, a cause an accident. Um, but I got up there and I ran down the sand hill with some friends and, and I had some friends that were running side by side. And there's a photo of it, I believe, in the book. And, and they dove in head first and they made it. I dove and I didn't. So what happened was I, my legs got tangled up in the sand and it threw me down the hill awkwardly to the point where I, uh, I jumped probably, you know, a half second too early. And because of that, I jumped into a, into a, the shallow end of, of Lake Powell and, and immediately, uh, broke my neck. Mm. 
And, uh, you know, it's amazing how much we all take for granted, right? I mean, how many of us take for granted being able to move our fingers, being able to get dressed on our own, being able to walk, uh, being able to, you know, pick up your loved one and give them a big hug and, and hold their hand. And, um, you know, these things were taken from me within seconds. And I realized then is that, you know, they're, they're privileges that we should always cherish because at any second they could be taken away like they did with me. And, uh, my whole life changed after that completely. Um, it was, it was scary. Um, I, uh, had my dad, my dad, you know, my, my, one of my best friends, Ryan Toon is his name. He was, he dove in the water with me and here I am, you know, I can hear my, my mom screaming, my, my, my little sisters, my, my brother, my dad, my girlfriend, her family, the kids screaming, they all saw it. And I thought, man, these are the saddest words anyone's going to ever hear before they die. Because here I am face first in the water and I'm sinking. And we all know Lake Powell. It's a deep, deep lake, right? And I'm thinking, oh, Lord, this is, this is how it's going to be, huh? And I'm like, I'm going to be carp bait. And this is, this is, this is how I'm going to go out. And wow, I never thought it'd be like this. And uh, I could hear them screaming for me. And they didn't know if I was alive or dead. And the only thing I could move was my neck. And so I shook my neck back and forth. And, and they saw that. And they said, oh, he's alive. He's alive. Someone get him. And uh, my friend Ryan swam and luckily caught me before I was sinking you know, too far to be reached. And then they brought me to the sand bank where I'd laid there, lifeless, um, where, you know, this big 6'2 frame that could bench 350 pounds. I couldn't even swat the flies off my face. It was humbling. And uh, I knew I needed the Lord then. I, I uh, You know, when you're in those difficulties, it's either fight or flight. And I knew the only fighting chance I had was embracing the Lord and 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 just having him help me and so i you know my dad gave me a blessing and shortly thereafter there's a few miracles i guess you could say that happened i there was two uh, er doctors from Col- from colorado that were there which is unheard of i mean i think lake powell shoreline is bigger than the west coast of the united states it's just a big lake and they happened to be there right there and then and uh you know what what they did was determine how bad i was injured and boy, that was humbling. Uh, as you've read in the book, you know, they they asked for a Sharpie. And they wanted a Sharpie just to see exactly the severity of my accident. And, you know, everyone's freaking out. And I'm just trying to keep it cool because anything I say or do is going to set off, you know, my loved ones. And because they're, they're it's, it's hysterical. I mean, can you imagine? And uh, so they start pinching me. And they say, okay, Brandon, if you can feel this, that means that you're, you know, you, you broke your back or your lower extremities. And, and if you can feel it, that means, that means that, that's a good thing. And so they start pinching my toes and they ask me, Brandon, can you feel that? And what does everyone do? They look at me, waiting for the answer that would make everything okay. And I wanted so badly to say yes. Uh, but I couldn't feel it. I didn't even know they were pinching my toes. And so they would take a black marker and mark my body. And they say, okay, you can't move his toes. Let's go a little higher up. Brandon, you know, can you feel your legs? I said, no. And there was another mark, kind of like a ladder. And they progressively got higher and higher. But each stroke was severely changing my life and determining my you know my my physical future i thought or my future and and so every slash i'm like great there goes walking there goes my ability to fish my ability to hike and and run and and just to you know just a love being in a body and it went higher there goes my waist there goes maybe a girlfriend there goes future kids maybe there goes you know, there goes, there goes a big portion of my life if that doesn't come back. 
Then it went higher, my stomach. There goes my six, my eight pack or 12, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was young, you know, I was naive still. I mean, that was important to me. And I go, well, there, there goes that. Um, there goes my bowels. There goes my ability to, you know, care for myself. And I said, no. And I went higher and higher and it got all the way up to my neck. And I couldn't even feel that. And the last words I remember saying is, dear God, I've lost everything. And it was humbling because I was in my body, but I had no use of it. You know, our, our bodies are temples, right? Temples of God that were created for us to, to strengthen and to use for good. And here I am. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I, I was stuck. It was, it's a weird feeling being trapped inside of your body. It really is when your body was the one that gave you that freedom. And uh, very tough, very tough. And I just, uh, you know, there's other miracles that happened in that story in the book. But I guess what I could say is um, I was leaving. I was being, again, I was in Life Flight. And Life Flight came and, you know, I, when I was injured when I was 12, I used Life Flight. And, and, like, you know, they got down there and they're like, this kid looks oddly familiar. And uh, I've I've been to Life Flight so many times. I think I have frequent flyer miles with them. <laughs> <laughs> but I got in there, and uh, I wanted so desperately for my mom to come with me, and they and she couldn't, and uh, because it was so hot in that canyon, that the helicopter could barely get enough lift just to lift me and and the nurse and the pilot out of the out of that hot canyon. So here I am, lying down, and I'm looking out the window. And I'm I'm flying away from a life that I thought I had down there. I left a part of me, a part of what I thought my life should be. And it took me a while to learn that I didn't lose my life there. At the time, I actually found it. That's when I was called to serve. <laughs> That's when I was called to serve. And it took me a while to, to realize this, but it wasn't just a two-year mission, but it was going to be a lifeline calling. And the prayers I uttered so badly, Lord, I just want to serve you, they were fulfilled. But oddly, you know, in, in, in a different way that I never, I never thought I would ever, would ever live. And isn't that life, though? You know, we, we learn in, you know, in church and in gospel classes that, Immortality, we are here to prove ourselves and, 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 and to go through hard things. But why is it that we always go through the things that we never wanted or expected to face in life? Isn't that interesting? And for me, you know, I knew trials would be part of life, but not these trials, not this way. But it was the Lord's way, and, and that was something I had to learn to eventually accept. Um, I don't know how much you want to talk about this, but it, I could talk for well, well, days. I, so I do have so I do have a question about it because you mentioned right before uh, the accident you religiously uh, exercised your neck. Yes. Uh, how do you think that played a role in all of this? Yeah, you know it's interesting. Um, when I was at the hospital there, and I got there, and, and even getting to there was a experience in and of itself. I. I was in a, um, uh, I guess you would call it a private jet uh, for hospitals to fly me to Salt Lake International Airport uh, to be operated on in Salt Lake there. And, and even getting in that and flying, you know, I was so depressed. And I knew it was bad when the nurse would not look in my eyes. Um, and, it, you know, it was haunting. And, and I'm thinking to myself, oh, Lord, like, I don't think life can get any worse than this. And I kid you not. A bolt of lightning struck the airplane. I guess we were flying through a thunder, a thunderhead, and it scared me. It scared the nurse. The pilot's like, "Ah, it happens," but I thought, well, maybe this is a, a sign. Say, you know, Brandon, I got you. Life can be worse. Just trust me. And uh, so I, I stopped complaining at least until I was on safe ground. But, um, but yeah. So when I got there, you know, the only thing I I was hoping to ask the surgeon before I went into surgery is, doctor, you can fix this, right? And he said, Brandon, I'm sorry. There's no fixing this. Um, and I remember them putting me asleep. 
and I was in tears. And I'm thinking, if there's no fixing this, Lord, Heavenly Father, please just take me. I don't know if I can live my life like this. But when I woke up, you asked about the, the, you know, working out. Well, they told me that if it wasn't for the added muscle that I put around my neck, my neck would have snapped like a twig and I would have Im- immediately died. Wow. And uh, so it was no, you know, it was meant to be. And I, you know, I've, some people ask me, well, geez, are you glad you followed um, that, that prompting with the Holy Ghost? Because that's what kept me alive. And to be honest, you know, there's some days where I'm like, you know, I'd be okay uh, graduating this life and and serving up there. But like I said, I'm glad that I follow I follow those promptings because this is the Lord's plan. It's it's not ours, right? We we came down here to follow His plan, and and uh, He's taken me in in ways that I never ever thought, you know, would be possible, and has challenged me countless times. But I responded, you know, having faith and 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 growing. I being eighteen at that time, being strong was everything to me. Being physically strong. But now, you know what true strength is, is is being spiritually strong. It's being able to control what's in between your head. Um I, I fully believe that if we base our circumstances on happiness our physical circumstances will never be happy because they can always be better. But if we base them on who we are and who we can become and, and based on serving and helping and loving and that's where happiness comes from. And the beauty of that is that no matter what happens in your life, if you lose a loved one, if you're diagnosed with a, you know, a, an illness that may take your life or, you know, an accident or whatever it may be, a weakness, we, we can choose how to respond to that. We can control how we act and, and how we respond. And um, I, I've, I always believe that when we're in darkness, when we're, when we're struggling, it's so important to take the path that leads us home. And uh, there's a famous quote that you guys have all heard, I'm sure. It says, when there's a fork in the road, take it. And forgive me, I can't remember who it was. It's a famous uh, famous speaker. But I always thought, well, that's that's no, no. I, you know, when I froze to death, and we can talk about that, I did not take the road that took me home. And it nearly cost me my life. And every decision we make in this life, the small decisions to the big decisions, are we thinking, are we taking the path that's leading us home? Are we taking the path that's leading us to our families, to our loved ones, you know, to improving ourselves? Um, and that's what I've tried to do, is always take that path that leads me home. Uh, Brandon, what was um, family life for you? What was it like for you at this time? What What was it like for your siblings and your parents immediately after um, your second accident? Yeah. Um, when, you know, as, as everyone knows, when a loved one, a family member goes through a, a terrible trial, it affects everybody. And it definitely did that to my parents and I'm the oldest out of out of four and I've got a younger brother and two younger sisters and um, during those 75 days I was in the hospital my parents were always there and in return you know they they couldn't be there as much uh, for my other siblings and everyone struggled um, with that it was it was tough uh, you know you get injured um, and you become paralyzed, but you never think about what, when you're in the, in the hospital, you never think about what life could be like once you leave. And we had, I had probably three weeks of a heads up saying, hey, we're going to be discharging you. Well, that's great and all, but when a house isn't wheelchair accessible, what does a family do? You know? And it was, it was tough. Um, oddly enough, my mom, years ago, always had an impression that I would be in a wheelchair. She never told me about it. She, as you know, in the book it reads, you know, she always thought maybe it's for, you know, us or for her, my dad, when they get older. But, um, no, she was inspired. You know, the mother's intuition is a powerful thing. And, and, uh, so 
one night she wrote up the whole plan, the blueprint on what a house would look like, our house, if I was in a wheelchair. And so um, one day we had an architect show up to the house and, you know, we're all struggling. I wasn't home yet. And, and my mom got out the blueprint and she said, no, this is how it's supposed to look like. And, wow. and so it was, you know, I think we were all prepared in our own various ways to dealing with this. And, and the Lord has directed our lives and, and the lives of my parents and my loved ones um, in a positive way. Uh, but don't get me wrong, it was very hard. Hard for my siblings being neglected at that time. Although my parents were, you know, try to be there as much as they could. It was tough because in the first few years, my mom took care of me. Um, it was very difficult. And, uh, you know, being a quadriplegic, I, could, I, I think I can honestly say I would not wish that on my worst enemies. It is such a difficult challenge, not only for those suffering it, but for those who are, you know, love that 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 love you and 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 are there to provide support. It's it's just it's just difficult. It really is, and so uh, it affected us. Yeah, it did affect us. But uh, you know, my sister now she is a uh, she is a nurse nurse practitioner. She has her own practice. I don't think she ever would have been that if it wasn't for my accident because she was at the hospital and she saw how I was treated, the good and the bad. But not only that, when I got home, she was one of my angels. She was one, was one that helped me. And she grew to love providing service and care for others. And so, you know, each each of my siblings have, have changed uh, for the better in their various ways uh, from that uh, accident. Brandon, you also suffered uh, immediately after your accident, and I believe still, from uh, nerve pain, which is really common for paraplegics and quadriplegics. Yeah. And you said in your book that it affected your mind, and it was really difficult to deal with. So how did you cope with that? How did you learn how to mentally cope with that? Yeah, that's, um, you know, that's that's something that people don't understand, or, you know, when, when they see somebody in a wheelchair... I don't think they understand that oftentimes the, the worst part about it is the nerve pain. Um, as I'm even talking to you right now, it feels like I'm sitting down on a second degree burn on my, on my legs and, and, and it just, it, it's always, it's always, it's always painful and it's a constant fight. Um, there is no easy answer or an easy scenario for me to, you know, a drug to take whatever it may be to stop it. Um, the only thing that has worked for me is, is staying busy. Um, I always have the saying, you're either pushing forward or rolling backward. And as long as you're anxiously engaged, right, in good works, that, te- that, that, that pain tends to yell at me less. If I am just stagnant and, and if I'm just sitting, no pun intended, but sitting and not doing anything, and certainly um, that gets my attention, and it can uh, drive anyone insane and depressed. Um, but I, I, I try to uh, I try to li- live within my spirit and not have my physical body, as much as I love it, drive me nuts. And so I guess you know that's I guess that's some of the ways I've I've learned to to cope. Uh, with the pain that that uh, never leaves me. I'd never really heard about nerve pain um, uh, in that in that yeah. way, and I could only imagine. I mean, it sounds like it would be so so painful, and yeah. uh, and I know as well. You talk about you didn't only have the physical pains, but you had uh, you suffered with depression uh, mentally. Um, what did you do to kind of cope with that, or or, or uh, you know overcome that? Wow, you know, there's a theme in my book, right? It, it talks about darkness and how it always follows us. It's part of life. You know, we're, we, we, we came down here to be challenged and, and for the good and for the bad and, and you know, and, and, to, and to feel both of those forces at work. And depression is a major disability that, that people suffer with in this life and, 
and and for me it's you know it call it situational call it whatever you, you call it it's 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 something that drags many souls down to misery and and for me i i um i didn't want to go that route since we're on my neck accident i guess i could share that uh, you know my my first day in the gym when i went to the gym there at the hospital i um was still in my post 18 mindset you know a big bodybuilder guy and and uh, they uh they go and put a wheelchair in my room and despised it did not want to look at it did not want to be in it that wasn't me that's not my story didn't want it but they put me in in it because that's the only way i could i could travel and i and i had my my brother he pushed me to the gym i said you know i just want to work out that's what i want to do and so you know i go in there and and i get there and i've got this hawaiian tank top on and you know i i think i'm looking good and whatever and and I get in there, and it's a geriatrics rehab facility, you know, gym. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, clearly we are lost. And so I, my brother turned me around, and the sweet nurse talked to me in a soft, you know, sweet voice, saying, "Yes, honey, this is this is the rehab facility." And uh, you know, right when I said that, an old guy pushed right by me, and. and uh, he uh, looked at me and asked me if I wanted to race because he saw my muscles still and he thought I could push. And so I said, okay, I've got to do it. And I pushed and I could only push two feet. And I was I was exhausted. And and then I could see him doing a Papa Willie looking back at me. And I'm like, ah, and you know, it was depressing. It really was. And, <laughs> and when I say old, he was like in his 50s, right? And I'm 18, right? So, but uh, now I'm the old guy. Um, but, uh, when I got in there, I learned a lot about life. And what I mean by that is there are so many people that would whine and just complain about about little things, meaningless things. Like I remember working out, um, you know, with my hands and arms. And there was many individuals in there that would complain about it hurts when they walk. And I thought, what about the pain you feel when you can't walk? And what's interesting is I saw people, and you could you could tell them, you could tell if they've given up with depression and fear, or if they had hope in their hope in their life by looking in their eyes. And I learned something there that that no one can put out that fire, that hope within, if if you allow it to. And so many of these people would allow their circumstances, their pains, their you know their challenges to control who they were. And that was a travesty because these people, yes, they had their challenges. But if they were put in perspective, I think they would realize how much that they truly had still. And that's something that I've always tried to look at, you know, to overcome depression is, is focus on what we have. Focus on what, what we can do. I know there's a great story about that when I went into rehab, you know, post-accident two years ago. And, and that, you know, that 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 miracle of thought that happened that, that made me say goodbye to the gym um, to focus on other areas of my life where I could be independent on. But I think, I, think that, I think that's the main point is just to what feeds your soul? Does worry and fear feed it or does hope and faith? Just whatever you're feasting on, really. And depression, when, when you feast upon anger and, and hope, you know, worry and, and focus on your circumstances, it's a lose-lose proposition. Um, so. so, Brandon, miracles and guardian angels seem to follow you. You've been through a lot, but you always seem to have something amazing happen to pull you through it. Yeah. What do you attribute that to? Oh, man. God, that's a tough question. What do I attribute it to? <laughs> I don't know, really. Um, I mean, we all have our angels. We all have our guardian angels. I'm no different than anybody else. So it's not like I'm any better than anybody. We are all, you know, children of God. And we all have the light of Christ within us. And so I think, but we, but we all have a story to tell, right? And and um, I think my eyes have been opened several times so that I could be that bright light I always wanted to be, but I never imagined it'd be in this way, in this position. I mean, 
I barely graduated high school. <laughs> I, I never thought I'd go to college. Never thought I'd be in a wheelchair. I never thought I would freeze to death. <laughs> I never thought that I would work. Well, I never thought I'd graduate getting a master's degree. I never thought I would work. Uh, I never thought I would have facial reconstruction. And certainly I never thought I would write a book. And, uh, you know, this story, I think, was just meant to be told. And uh, I think that's why I've been blessed and that's why I've been kept alive so that I, I could tell it. Because it truly is a very unique story, as you guys can attest to, uh, that many people do not have, thankfully, have the, you know, have the life to, to, to live with all these challenges. But I, but I, you know, it's, it's something where I think it gives people hope. I know it does. And it gives people motivation on, you know, someone like me can do it with the lessons that I've learned within the book. Anyone can. And, uh, I, I hope it brings people closer to God. And that's, that's what it's done for me with my challenges. And, and I've had, yeah, I've had special moments where, where I know that we have help on the other side. There's not doubt in my mind that uh, they exist. Do you feel comfortable sharing any of those with us? Oh, boy. Um, yeah, I think I could share one, uh, if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, it's not in the book because it doesn't need to be. Um, my book is a non-denominational Christian book. But... You know, I did have an experience where I knew of a surety that darkness is real, but so is the light. And what I mean by that is is that we do have evil spirits that are always after us, trying to take us away from being who we can truly become. And we also have our guardian angels that are, that are always there to protect us if we so choose and if, if we live accordingly. Um, an experience I had was I, I was getting ready to, it was a few years after my accident, I was getting ready to serve or take out my endowments in the Bountiful Temple. And um, I just had my bishop's interview and with the state president and was looking forward to it. All my friends at the time were on missions, you know, and I was still struggling with the fact that I wasn't um, in that type of fashion. Um, and I was getting asked all the time to, to speak, um, to share my story. And I still was kind of iffy about that because uh, I was still struggling myself. Um, and for many nights, I was inflicted by, by you know, a, a bad presence in my room that would immediately go after my voice box. What I mean by that is my voice. And tried to scare me in a way that would dissuade me from speaking about my story, sharing it, and also dissuade me from attending the temple. Um, and so I struggled with that for 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 weeks. And um, I, that's all I can say. I could say more, but that's all I felt comfortable saying with that. But, but I will tell you, um, there was one night where. I was struggling immensely, and I finally called it away, um, you know, with raising the hand, and and uh, but it was still in my hallway, and it was walk, walking up and down the hallway, and I could hear it, and he wanted me to know he was there, and it was like 2 o'clock at night, and on my bed where I lay, I, uh, I have like a, a little like microphone in case I need help. Um, at night, and so I, I, I called my parents, and I said, hey, is that you guys walking up and down the hallway because you're making an awful lot of noise, and I was like, no, honey, we're, we've been asleep, and it's like, so there's no one in the house? No? And right when I said that, my back door opened and slammed shut, and they heard it as well, and my dad, I love my dad, but when he's tired, nothing will wake him up, and so my poor... My poor mom, you know, she she goes down there and, um, uh, you know, not knowing what to expect, not knowing. And uh, she goes down there and she sees this big, white, uh, not white, dark, dark spirit walking up and down my hallway. 
And what do you do when, when you see something like that? And my mom, in her motherly instinct, she knew that I needed help. And so she walked through it. And right when she's getting ready to walk through it, she had a voice inside say, do not look at it. If you look at it, you will give it more power, ignore it, and walk through. And so she did. And uh, my back was against the hallway, so I couldn't see anything. And and uh, she asked me if I was okay. I said, yeah, I'm fine. And, you know, I didn't. At, at that time at night, I wasn't struggling with anything. I didn't feel I was in any danger. And and so she, she didn't tell me about it. Um, and so she got back up and was ready to, to, to leave. And she could see it pacing up and down my hallway, trying to get into my room. Just trying. You could tell it was mad. And uh, fear started to take a hold of her. And, and she didn't want to um, walk through that. And right when she's about ready to walk through my doorway, she heard someone whisper, look, look up, because her head was down. And when she looked up, her eyes were open, and she saw uh, two big guardian angels with, she described, golden spears, uh, spears um, going, you know, as like a, as a cross, um, protecting my doorway. And she could see that these great, Guardian angels were protecting me, not allowing him to enter. And uh, she, uh, that gave her strength, and she walked through. And he, you know, this dark spirit followed followed her for, you know, ten feet or so, and then he went back to trying to get in. Um, later, my dad quickly came down after that, and by then, you know, it was gone. But I do remember what he asked me, and it's. I think this is an important thing for us to always remember. He said, Brandon, what did you pray for uh, tonight? And I said, you know, Dad, you know I've been struggling, right, with being bombarded, bombarded by, you know, this evil presence. And I said, but for the last few days, I've changed my prayers. I've asked for the, if the Lord could please provide me protection from my guardian angels. Because all I want to do is serve I want to I want to attend a temple and I want to start being that voice of strength for others that you know they can overcome their paralyzing challenges and my dad just started crying and he said I'm so grateful that that's what you prayed for and, and then my mom came down and she told me all about it and it was a special moment for us and um, it's something that that I you know I'll remember for the rest of my life and. And uh, it was it was a beautiful moment, and and it just shows that we do have our guardian angels always by us. All it takes for us is just a just a simple prayer of faith, and you'll be surprised the strength and the protection that they'll give you um, in times of need. Um, you know that I had another experience where it's in the book, um, but if I may, this wasn't in the book. Because it did not apply to everybody, but I think it applies to those within our faith. When I was freezing to death, and when I was dying, literally, I was at my weakest moment. And what's interesting about the adversary is that when, when we're, whenever we're at our weakest moment, wherever it may be, that's when the adversary makes his appearance. Because we're, we're at our weakest. And I was dying, and... I, I can't give away the story, but it's an amazing story, as you guys can attest to. It is amazing. Uh, um, but here I was. I was dying. I had red ants walking all over me, biting me, and I'm I'm freezing to death. And and the wind is howling, and it's raining, and I'm in short sleeves and and a shirt, and I've got a phone that's three feet away from me that I can't grab, and it was so frustrating. And it was so painful. And I had this dark feeling, and I don't know if I heard it with my ears or with my spirit, but it was it was a it was not a good good feeling. I was in so much pain and I was fearful because I prayed for hours and I received nothing. And I was dying. And so I said, and so this this voice said, Brandon, just hold your breath. You're going to heaven. Just hold your breath. Take yourself out of it. You don't deserve this. 
And at the time, I bought into it. And I was so weak. I was going in and out of consciousness. I knew that if I held my breath long enough, I would, I would die. And there's no doubt in my mind. And so I took one last deep breath and I held my breath. And it seemed like it went on for four plus minutes. I mean, it was so close for me crossing over because I was just sick of it. I was sick of the pain. And, and I know pain. And this was just beyond. And um, right before then, I had this powerful but loving feeling whisper in my soul. I said, Brandon, breathe. Brandon, breathe. This is not your call. This is mine. I will decide when and how you basically graduate this life. It's not today. And so I had this warmth inside my soul because, you know, the Holy Ghost just spoke so loudly. And so I woke up and tried to get myself out of this trance, this, you know, this darkness, and I just struggled breathing. And, and uh, I held on for another hour. That's as long, or maybe two. I don't remember. But the last words I remember saying is, Heavenly Father, take me or save me. I can't do it any longer. And then the next thing you know, as in the book, I wake up a day and a half later in IMC Hospital. But what's not in the book is the gentleman who found me. They, it was a Davis County Search and Rescue. Um, they were searching for me for five plus hours. Still nothing. They were getting hypothermia themselves, and they had coats on. And um, this gentleman... It was way back there. He had a feeling that he should go down this other road before he, you know, he had to call it a day, basically. And when he went down there, he saw me. And, of course, I'm hitting upside down, and I'm, I'm dead. I'm white as a ghost. There's no heartbeat. They took my temperature. I was 73 degrees. I mean, just picture that for a moment. <laughs> when, when we get a fever, like, 104 is dangerous, right? It's, it feels pretty bad. Well, our normal temperature is, what, 98 degrees, I believe? Well, here I am, 73 degrees. So it gives you an idea of, the, of just the pain I, had, I was going through. And, um, so, I, yeah, I was dead. And so he took off my clothes, and he saw that I was wearing my garments. And he said, oh, my goodness. And then the Spirit spoke to him. And he told me this months after my accident. But he said, when I was up there, Brandon, I remember... I remembered my patriarchal blessing. And in that blessing, it reads that if I remain faithful and if I am a covenant keeper, because of the priesthood, I will have the ability to literally raise somebody from the dead. He said, Brandon, the reason why I joined the Davis County Search and Rescue, I mean, these are all volunteers that joined this. I joined that because I felt like that was going to be the opportunity I had to fulfill um, that blessing. And the gentleman that was with them, he was a uh, Air Force, worked at the Air Force um, hill field there, and he was religious, but but wasn't you know, unaware of the priesthood power and and all that. Um, great, you know, and, and that great blessing that took place. But they said a miracle happened because right after that, that my heart started to beat very faintly, but it started to beat. Of course, I wasn't awake; I was in a coma. But they knew that literally I'm alive again. And it was a challenge for me to get off the hill in, in and of itself as the book reads. But, but um, yeah, that was, that was special. And it just goes to show that, you know, there are still miracles today um, that we often don't hear about. But they happen every day. And, and that definitely was one of them. And, and uh, I have a very sweet, sweet place my heart for for him and and for his righteousness uh because without it <laughs> i don't know I, I i i might not have published this book it it would have it would have been published maybe on the other side but in, in a different way so that's that's one story or yeah that's one story that's not in the book that uh, i think it's very powerful thank you for sharing all these little tidbits uh, with us because they they definitely uh, add just that much more context to the story and um, man I mean uh, 
A show that me and my mom always loved to watch together it was a show called I Shouldn't Be Alive. <laughs> I don't know if you've ever heard that show. And I, I feel that way every day. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what I'm that's what I'm getting to is as I was reading your book, I mean, I I did I, I listened to the audio, but then I also read the book as well. And it's almost like every chapter can be its own episode on that show. I mean, you could fill up an entire, you know, all the episodes, an entire series of of that show with all of these different stories uh, from your life. I mean, it, it really is remarkable uh, to be able to to see all of these these wonderful miracles in your life, but then you have so much adversity that goes with it that it would just be, it's just amazing to be able to see what you've come through, what what your story is, and how how you've been able to uh, accomplish so much. And you talked about right after you were, uh, you know, nineteen, just graduating high school, and you name off all of these things that you didn't know you would do. And it's such a full, rich life that someone like me is listening to, thinking, "Wow, how can I be more like that? How do I get out of this office in the publishing house more often to have some sort of adventure?" Obviously, you don't want to have all of the trials that go with it, <laughs> but uh, it's just remarkable to see the type of person that you are, the type of uh, the growth that you've gone through. I mean, at one point in the book, you talk about God's or well, what I, I call God's or orchestrations. You called it something else, something where it's like God puts people in certain places at, at, at certain times. Do you remember what you called that? I can't remember what you called it. Uh, it put me on the spot. Um, hmm, I don't remember exactly that term. Well, ba basically, it was the idea that in any of these trials, you had people who were placed at the right time, like at Lake Powell, where you have doctors, or this yes. individual who you just shared that you didn't have in the book, uh, which added a lot of context to this, that had the ability to, uh, you know, raise people from the dead, and right. some of those things. Are you talking about the angel chapter where he talks about how um, angels can be people that are living as well? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely talking about that as well. Just the idea that that uh, God cares about us so much that there's oftentimes many people put in our in our lives at different places at different times. And you'd, you'd called it something. But in essence, it was the way that God can orchestrate um uh, these experiences where you know you're not alone in these instances. It's true. It, it doesn't take an angel on the other side to answer somebody's prayers. It just takes somebody willing, right? And I had so many willing people that followed the promptings of the Spirit that were there in the right place and time um, to save me, literally. Um I mean, just the simple story of me going to college and I'm falling out of my chair, right, in my truck. And if I would have fallen, it would have been death. And I'm screaming and somebody just happens to walk by right as I'm falling and he catches me. Yes, the Lord orchestrates everything. And um, I've been privileged more than I would have liked <laughs> to uh, to have those uh, angels um, help me that are mortal. I've just really enjoyed having the opportunity to visit and to be able to um, really look at the miracles that you've had, the type of person that you are, and really the calling that you've been able to have throughout your life to be able to bless so many other people's lives because of the stories, the trials, but also the miracles, the hope, and uh, the opportunities that uh, that that you've just been able to you know it, it emanate from your life. I guess one thing I can ask you, Brandon, is, is you know, the title is We Are All Paralyzed. Um, what, what's the meaning of that title? Yeah, it, it's, uh, it's how many people know somebody who's paralyzed, right? Or how many people have seen someone become paralyzed? How many people are becoming paralyzed right now? Being paralyzed comes in many shapes and forms. We all have issues that we hold on to that hold us back, that paralyze us, that paralyze us from being the individuals that the Lord intends us to be. Um, we have, you know, divinity in, in our path uh, in life, and we sometimes allow 
the small things and the big things we go through to paralyze us. And that's, that's, that's a shame. Um, I always believe that fortunes are born out of misfortunate beginnings. And, and it's our challenges, really, that redefine who we are and, 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 and build us into people of, of great worth. And we shouldn't be looking at our challenges as things that paralyze us. Um, and part of that uh, title was taken from a chapter uh, where I'm speaking to a room full of juveniles. And I realized then that we are all paralyzed. We all have our issues. Um, but it's, you know, it, it doesn't define who we are. What defines us is how we react to it and, and how we grow from those paralyzing challenges. So that's why it's named We're All Paralyzed, because we all can relate. We all can relate in this book to challenges. And, and I hope this book will teach people how to overcome those paralyzing challenges and, and learn that, that we have challenges for our betterment and not for our destruction. Uh, they are for our betterment. And um, that's why we, uh, I entitled it We're All Paralyzed. I love it. I love I love that concept behind it. And yeah. how did how did um how did the book happen? How did it all start? Oh my goodness, this is a story. Um I had a dear dear friend of mine after I broke my neck. I knew him before, Bruce Porter. He was of the 70 and uh he was a faithful friend, one of my best friends. And he would come over at least twice a month and would talk to me and give me a blessing and he was a good mentor for me, and I would talk about my stories and my insights, and, and from day one, he said, Brandon, you have a story to tell, and you're being kept alive for a special purpose, and one of these days, you're going to write a book that will change many lives. He said, just continue to push forward, my friend. So I did, and as the years went on and more challenges came, he was there by my side 24-7 when I needed him. Even when he was serving in Russia, he was there calling me, um, emailing me. There was a time, um, you know, 10 years ago where we actually started writing a book. And at the time, he, he called it Where Eagles Fly. And we did a few chapters, and, and it, was, it, was, it was a beautiful rendition, a little bit of my life. And but it never went anywhere. And I wanted to get back to it, but he had passed on. And I, I hate the word death because death, it's not death. It's a graduation. He, he graduated to the next step that we all must go through. And it was a glorious gra graduation, no doubt, no doubt for Bruce. He's a great man. And so when he, when he left, I'm like, oh man, he was he was the guy I could bounce, bounce ideas off of, and, and he was a great support. Well, I was asked to give a fireside um, to a ward uh, here locally, and I had a friend in high school that came up to me. Her name is Kate. She's the co-author of the book. And she said, Brandon, have you ever thought about writing a book? I'm like, yeah, of course. I've got 400 pages worth of notes. I just need somebody to, you know, to help me go through it. She goes, well, I'm a writer, and I really feel strongly that, that me and you need to work on this. So I said, great. So we started working on it. No less than two weeks afterwards, I get a call from Cedar Fort saying, Brandon, have you ever thought about writing a book? I said, it's funny you mention that. <laughs> I just started. Here are a few chapters. And then I guess as they say, the rest is history. Um, but that's how the book started. And um, I've got a, a sweet um, uh, part in it where it talks about Bruce in the end. And uh, just recently, I had a very dear photo that I posted on my Facebook page. It's with Susan Porter. Um, she's now in the uh, General Relief Society board of the church. And it's with me and her, and she's holding that book. And I, I look at it, I just can't help but smile. And, and, and just if our eyes were open, we would see Bruce standing right by his beautiful wife, smiling at me in that photo uh, with that book because he was one of the angels on the other side that really helped put this special message that this book brings um, to, to, to the readers. Um, 
he was no doubt one of those angels that helped me. And, and so I'm grateful for him and his support that he's given me from both sides. So that's how the book came about. That's great. So what's next for you? What are you working on? Well, I just got done speaking for Hope Works. That was last week. It was at the conference center in their theater, and it went really, really well. And that video should be posted in October, mid-October, uh, early November. And I think a lot of people will, will really enjoy it. And, and uh, it talks about, my talk was about how adversities bring us closer uh, to others. It, it, it makes us connect with others. It gives us empathy. It brings us closer to God and to those around us. And, and I share a few great uh, stories in the book of, of that gentleman who, who named his son after me because of just my simple act of love and, and, and the people helping me at school and me helping them. And so it went really well. So I just did that. Um, I do do a lot of speaking, um, both professionally and with churches. And I will continue doing that until the day I die. It's part of my calling. And so um, that's what I'm doing. And I'm enjoying the ride so far. And <laughs> believe it or not, just last week, I got called to be in the bishopric. Wow. Which is Congratulations. crazy. Congratulations. <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, it, that story is hilarious, too, by the way. I just got out of the Bountiful Temple. I serve there every Tuesday. Have, you know, have... I had pretty much ever since that experience I told you about, because I'm like, no, you're not going to tell me what to do. I'm going to go to the temple, and I'm going to go there every week. I'm going to show you. So that's what I do. I got out of the temple, and I knew I was meeting with the state president, and uh, I get there, and with me going to the temple, I'm, I'm in my temple whites. I can't you know, change on my own, and so I just go pre-dressed. And so I got to the state center and sat down with the state presidency, and and the first question they asked is, Brandon, are you temple worthy? And I'm like, guys, like, what am I wearing? Like, I'm not the milkman. I just got out of the temple. <laughs> That's I mean, I've got, a, I've got a name tag that says Bountiful Temple Brandon Solzer. I mean, come on, guys, really? <laughs> and, and they laughed. And, and, then, and then they told me, Brandon, you've been called to be the second counselor in, in your bishopric. And I just started crying because there's so many things in my life that I thought I have missed physically. Uh, you know, with, with 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 the joys that that brings, and I thought surely one of that one of those things would have been a calling like this. And I said, guys, I'm in a family ward, and I'm not married. Like, is that legal? Is that okay? <laughs> and he said, yes. Yeah. So we've passed it with the brethren, and we feel strongly that that you've been called. And and so it, it was, it, you know, it's beautiful how how the Lord really guides our life if we just trust in the Lord and. And here I am. I've got a calling that I thought I would never have, and so that's new. Um, so, so I'm curious. Then, how do you have you conducted a meeting yet at Sacrament? No, actually, as we speak, I'm being set apart this Sunday, and I guarantee you, <laughs> the audience is going to be hard for the audience not to get up and cheer, because <laughs> I love them immensely. They love me, and and I think when they hear that, I think. I think it will be a hallelujah type of type of uh, reaction. So um, it's very special to me. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing with that. Yeah. I, I mean, <laughs> thank you for sharing that with us. Um, so where, as we as we kind of finish this podcast, where can our listeners continue to follow you? Where where are you on yeah. the, on social media? Yeah, I, I'm I'm on Facebook, Brandon Solzer. I've got a website. Uh, BrandonSolter.com. I'm on Instagram as well, and uh, would love to have you follow me. And I do share insights and, and messages, and 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 what's going on in my life. And and I, I hope that's a place where people can gather strength and, and and insight from my unusual life and the experiences that it's brought me. So, Valerie, before we end, do you have any last comments that you want to make? Um, just that there was also a BYU TV video done right. on Brandon That's as well that people can find. Right. Um, do you uh, recall what it was called? So they um, can find it more easily. You know, that's a good question because I have looked. It's called Lectures of Faith. It was aired a few weeks ago on Sunday. But I don't know if it's on BYU TV. So how they can find it would be um, on my website. If you go to my website, you'll see the video. And 
as you guys, Valerie, can attest to, I think it's done really well. Um, talks about some of my accidents and, and, and how I've adapted. But uh, that's where they can view it. And, uh, yeah, so... Yeah, it is a great video, and it, it it's a great compliment to the book as well because um, it does show your family and your home and stuff, and so it does give some images um, to the story so that you can kind of understand what it's like for him to, like, get in his truck and that sort of thing. You know, yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just going to say that's a good point that you bring up those images on BYU TV. I had consumed most of Brandon's book through the audio book, and then when I grabbed the physical copy – it's covered in in pictures, and uh, and and it's a it adds that extra layer when you actually see some of these accidents or the aftermath or you know all the, all these different pictures. It really adds that context to it. So I'm glad you brought that up with the BYU TV. Yep, yep. And uh, Ben Cummings, I thought did a great job being the voice. His voice may sound familiar. He's also the voice in the Saints audiobook. Uh, that the church has put out. So you did a great job. I know I recognize that voice. I love that yeah. audiobook. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good voice. All right. Well, uh, Brandon, we'll let you have the last few words. But before we uh, move to that, I just want to thank you for your willingness to do this uh, recording with us and um, for the opportunity we've had to be able to get to know you as a publishing house, to be honored in, in publishing this. Uh, to uh, so many people's lives that I know will be able to be affected by who you are and and the story that you have. And it's just been a wonderful opportunity to be able to spend this uh, this hour with you. So thank you for that, and we'll let you have the last words. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate those kind words. Thank you. Um, last words. Well, in life, you either push forward or roll backward. And I can guarantee you that where your head goes, your body always follows. So always ask yourself, where is your head going when you're struggling? How are you reacting? What are you thinking? And then ask yourself, when is the last time you've looked up? What I mean by up is when have you looked in the positives, for the positives in your life? When have you seen God in your life? And I guarantee you that the more times you look up, the more times you'll realize that God has been there every step of the way. You just haven't noticed it. So that's what I would like to say. Wow. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, thank you, guys. It's thank a pleasure. You. Thank you. So we're going to have to make sure this podcast doesn't release before Sunday. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you can't let the cat out of the bag yet. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want your ward members uh, catching on that you're in the bishopric before, you, before it's official. <laughs> very true. Very true. Yeah.